Okay, now we're going to do the second half of chapter 10. We start with hemostasis. This is a process of stopping blood flow and a vessel break. There are three major phases, vascular spasms, platelet plug formation, and coagulation, which is the actual clotting of the blood. In vascular spasms, here platelets release a chemical called serotonin. This causes the blood vessels to spasm. Though spasming narrows the blood vessel, thus decreasing blood flow until the clot forms. So you don't bleed out, basically. The second step is the platelet plug formation, which takes only about a minute. Okay, first of all, you got to understand platelets are repelled by intact endothelium. What is that? Endothelium is the lining of the blood vessel. So if it's smooth, intact, there's no tears, then platelets are repelled. They're not going to stick there. Okay? So there has to be some type of tear or something to cause the platelets to stick. So when broken collagen fibers are exposed, platelets stick to them. Those anchor platelets release ADP to attract more platelets until the plug is formed. That's a positive feedback. So you start calling platelets and you call more and more and more and more until you get the plug formed. Now PGI inhibits platelet aggregation and limits the formation to the immediate area. What does that mean? Well that means that we only want platelets where the blood vessel is broken. We don't need you clotting. You know, say you broke a blood vessel in your right leg. We don't need you to send platelets to your left leg or to your heart or to your lungs or anywhere else. Just to that area. All right, in this picture you can look. Again, you got step one. That's a vascular spasms where they're releasing serotonin, basically trying to narrow the hole so you don't bleed out. Step two, the platelets are starting to stick to the broken collagen fibers, which you can see in the picture, and that's going to form the platelet plug. Then we're going to move into step three, which is coagulation. Coagulation, the blood is transformed from a liquid to a gel, which does require vitamin K, now, which you get from all your leafy green vegetables. Now, first step, the injured site releases tissue factor. Tissue factor forms prothrombin activator. Prothrombin activator converts prothrombin to thrombin, which is an enzyme. Thrombin joins fibrinogen proteins into fibrin molecules and makes a meshwork. That is to trap red blood cells, thus sealing off the hole. Now, the clot retracts to pull the ruptured edges closer. Platelets contain myosin and actin, thus that's how they contract. Now, PDGF, platelet-derived growth factor, stimulates the vessel wall to rebuild, much like tissue repair. Here is a picture of that fibrin mesh that we made during coagulation, and you can see it trapping the red blood cells. All right, your imbalance, undesirable clotting. You have a thrombus that is a clot formed in an unbroken vessel. Typically, it's the legs, and it can form a blockage and become life-threatening. An embolus is a thrombus that breaks free into the bloodstream, and it can lodge in the brain and cause a stroke, or it can be a pulmonary embolism and block the lungs, and or it could be a cardiac embolism where it blocks the heart, in which case none of these three scenarios are good and almost always will you'll ultimately end up dying if we don't catch them in time and it's a time sensitive issue. Now this can occur, this undesirable clotting can occur where that endothelium, the inner lining, has been roughened. Doesn't even have to be torn, could be roughened, maybe by a burn or a blow. Um, maybe fatty material accumulation. Okay, we've had instances where you have uh, 12-year-old kids playing baseball. He gets hit in the head with a blow. Mom, you know, goes, "Well, he's okay. He doesn't seem to be that bothered." And then he goes home and he dies in his sleep. Well, mom didn't take him to the emergency room. She didn't know that that blow caused the endothelium to roughen. He got a blood clot while he was sleeping. 
it became an embolus, went to his brain, stroked him out, and he died. So it is a big deal. That's why you want to follow through on these things. For fatty material accumulation, that's plaque. That's where that high cholesterol, high triglycerides becomes a major problem. Now, we use aspirin or heparin to clear clotting proteins and immobilize patient where blood may pool. This is a big problem right after surgery. So your post-surgery care is, is even not, not the recovery room, but when they're actually out on the floor recovering, it's very important to make sure you're checking your patients for clots. Bleeding disorders. You have thrombocytopenia which is where you have insufficient platelets. You get these purple blotches called petechiae. It's seen when the myeloid tissues are suppressed, like due to bone marrow cancer, radiation, drugs, and all kind of problems. Hemophilia is a lack of clotting factors. Here you get prolonged bleeding, could be um, a, a cause or even you know a repercussion. Bleeding in joints then can cause uh, them to become disabled and lock up. Okay, now we're going to get on to transfusions. All right, blood loss causes vessels to constrict and bone marrow to increase blood cell formation. A loss of 15 to 30 percent causes paling and weakness. Loss of 30 percent or more causes shock. A whole blood transfusion is only done for severe blood loss. We like to do packed red cell infusions. This is basically whole blood but without the plasma. Now this allows for uh, less reaction to occur. Now this is the packed red cell infusions. Again we like to use those you know, for the most part. Obviously if you have a problem with your patient bleeding out like all the blood is going away then we're gonna have to do whole blood transfusions because you'll have to replace the blood volume. But a lot of times they'll simply use normal saline and packed red cell infusions if we don't have whole blood. Now we specially use this with anemics so that they can get their red blood cell and oxygen carrying capacities back. Now the shelf life of collected blood is only about 35 days. That's why it's very important that you donate blood on a regular basis. All right, let's look at the human blood groups. All right, red blood cell membranes, the cell membranes, bear 30 types of glycoprotein antigens. Okay, an antigen is a pretty word for glycoprotein. Now you've kind of talked about this before earlier on in the course. Remember there are proteins found on the cell membrane that are cellular IDs. They tell us things about the cells. Okay, We call these antigens and all they are is literally a protein with a sugar attached. The arrangement of those sugars, the numbers of those sugars tell us different things. So we're going to be talking about antigens just for human blood groups. When you get to the immune system, you'll be talking about other types of antigens. All right, so these antigens can be perceived as foreign if transfused blood is mismatched. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And they are unique to each individual. They are also promoters of agglutination, where antibodies attach, causing clumping. Okay, again, we'll kind of hit on these in a second. Now, the presence or absence of each antigen is used to classify bud cells into different groups. There are three groups, A, B, and O. So you have multiple blood types. Okay, you have A, you have B, you have AB, and you have O. So there are four types of blood. Now, even though there are four types of blood, there's only two antigens, an A or a B. So if you have a red blood cell that has the A antigen, that means that you have type A blood. If you have a red blood cell with a B antigen, then you have B blood. The absence of both antigen gives type O. So if you don't have, if you have a red blood cell with neither A or B, then you have type O blood. If you have a red blood cell with both A 
and B antigens, then we say that you are type AB. Now, infants form antibodies against antigens not present. Okay, so let's give an example. A baby with only A antigens on their cells will make antibodies for B. So basically, you make antibodies for the antigens you do not have. So if I am A blood, I have the A antigen. So I will make antibodies against B. Now what are antibodies? Antibodies are basically going to go out and kill. So if I say that I'm type A blood, because I have my red blood cells with the A antigen. And my body is naturally going to make antibodies against B. So, I'm having surgery and I need a transfusion. Okay, A blood can get A blood. It can also get O blood, but we're going to talk about that in a second. But what happens if you give me B blood? Ooh, all those antibodies now in my bloodstream start attacking that B blood and cause it to rupture and start clumping together, which we call agglutination. So agglutination is bad. That's a mismatch. Okay. Now let's go back and talk about this universal donor and universal recipient. All right. Remember back, if you have the A antigen, you have A blood. If you only have the B antigen, then you have B blood. If you have both antigens, A and B, then you have type AB blood. If you have neither antigen, neither the A or the B, then we say you're O. Okay, that's your recap. So now, let's go. If I'm type A blood, that, remember, that means that you have the A antigen, which means that you're going to make B antibodies. If you have the B antigen, then your B blood, your body will make antibodies to A. If you have type AB blood, which means that you have both A and B antigen, your body does not make antibodies to either A or B. So that means that you can receive any blood. You can receive A blood, B blood, AB blood, O blood, any of them, because you are not going to attack anything. That's the problem in a mismatch. Okay, for example, like we were talking about before, if I'm type A blood and you give me B blood, my antibodies will attack that B blood. But if I am AB blood, then I don't make any antibodies. So when you give me any blood, A blood or B blood, I don't have any antibodies to attack it, so I can get anything. Now, universal donor, that's O negative. Let's talk about it. Here, it has neither antigen. And since that's what reacts, it can donate to anybody. Now, what does that mean exactly? Okay, well, let's go back to the example of I am type A blood and I receive B blood. My antibodies are going to attack that B antigen. Okay, now, what if I am type A blood and you give me O blood? my body immediately goes to that red blood cell and starts looking for antigens to attack. But O doesn't have any, so there's nothing to attack. So anybody can receive O blood. That makes them the universal donor. Now that's all fine and dandy for them, but let's look at the other side of that for them. Because they do not have either A or B antigens, they're going to make antibodies to both. So, if you have O blood, you can only receive O blood. Because if we give you anything else, 
you're going to make antibodies to it and you're going to attack it. Okay, so let's go back over that one more time. O blood does not have either antigen. So there's nothing to react when you donate that blood. But it makes antibodies to both antigens because it doesn't have either one. So when it goes to receive blood, it can only get it from another O because if it tries to get blood from A or B, it makes antibodies against both and it will attack it. Now, let's move on to the other part. We have to look at RH, which we got from the rhesus monkey, which is where we found all this. Now, if you are RH positive, that means that your red blood cells carry the RH antigen. If you're RH negative, that means your red blood cells do not carry the antigen. All right, so when you go and you're told, you know, I'm A positive or A negative, that positive or negative is the RH. So if you're A positive, that means that you have the A antigen and the RH antigen. If you're A negative, that means that you have the A antigen and that's it. Now, antibodies are not automatically formed if not present. Remember, back with our ABO groups, antibodies were automatically made. You made antibodies against what you didn't have. Here, if an RH negative person is exposed to RH blood, positive blood, then the body makes antibodies for RH. Um, that's a typo, sorry. It says the body will make antigens that should be antibodies for RH. The second time you now get exposed to RH positive, that will cause hemolysis and agglutination. So the red blood cells start rupturing and clumping together. So what does that mean? Okay, well, first of all, you have no idea if a negative person has been exposed to positive blood or not. So you always treat them like they have. So now, let's look. Negative blood can only receive negative. Positive blood can receive negative or positive. Okay, so let's look at it again. All right, so remember, if I am positive, that means I have the RH antigen. If I'm negative, I do not, which means I'm going to make antibodies against the RH antigen. So let's say that I am A positive and you give me A positive blood. Works out perfect. It's the exact same thing. Everything's great. What if you have to give me A negative? Well, then that's okay because I have the RH antigen and I'm good. What if I'm A negative? And now the best thing for me to get is A negative blood. You want to try to keep the same if you can. What if there's o, no A negative blood available? Okay, well then you want to go to O negative. You cannot go to A positive because if I'm A negative I make antibodies against the RH antigen and if you give me positive blood my antibodies will attack that positive antigen so again negative blood can receive only from negative so if you're a negative you can get a negative but you cannot get a positive but positives can get from positive and negative. So if I'm A positive, I can get A positive blood and A negative. All right, this is important talking about RH, especially with pregnant women. If you have an RH negative pregnant woman, during the first pregnancy, if the baby is RH positive, the mother will make RH positive antibodies. So the subsequent pregnancies, the antibodies would attack the fetus, thus killing it. That results in anemia, cyanosis, fetal transfusions have to be done. It's ridiculous. Now, this is prevented if the mother receives the Rogam shot. And we've been using this since the 70s. 
You're given this immediately after the first birth. This desensitizes the immune response. Basically, it tells your body not to make antibodies so that you don't try to kill the fetus. All right, blood typing. So let's look. This is cross matching. This is testing for agglutination in the donor and the recipient. All right, so this gets a little kind of confusing, but don't let the words, you know, bring you down. It's all right. All right, so we, we've learned a lot of words antigen, antibody. Okay, remember antigens were just proteins found on the cell, antibodies were made to attack whatever antigen you do not have. Okay, so if you look to the right, you see anti-A serum and anti-B serum. Okay, what is that? All right, so let's figure out what we're doing over here. When we blood type you or cross match you, what we do is we get a serum, an anti-A serum and an anti-B serum. We take the patient's blood and we have this little tray with wells or hollowed out areas. We put the patient's blood into each well, which you can see easily by that picture. So we put the patient's blood in the wells and then in the far left well we put anti-A serum. Anti-A serum contains A antibodies, which means that it will kill anything with the A antigen or it'll cause it to agglutinate or clump. Anti-B serum has B antibodies and it will try to kill the B antigen. All right, so let's look. In this first one, it tells you that you have type AB blood. Well, how did we figure that out? Okay, well, we put the patient's blood in, we gave them anti-A serum, and you saw this reaction, that clumping, the agglutination. That tells us, because the anti-A serum has A antibodies, it was looking for the A antigen, and if it found it, it would cause agglutination or clumping. It would lyse it. And that's exactly what's happened. So, that blood must contain the A antigen. Now, if we only do that test, that's not conclusive. That only tells us A, but they could be A, B. We don't know. We never tested for B. So you always got to do both. The anti-B serum, again, is going to have B antibodies, so it's going to try to kill the B antigen. And it did that. As you can clearly see, you had the agglutination, which means that, that blood also had the B antigen. So that's why we say that this blood was type AB. If we look at the second one, notice here it only agglutinated or reacted with anti-A serum. Didn't do anything with B, which means that it definitely has the A antigen, but it does not have the B antigen, or it would have reacted with the anti-B serum. So this person has type A blood. Same thing is done for type B. Now if we look at the bottom, type O. Remember type O doesn't have either A or B antigen. So when we put it in the anti-A serum and the anti-B serum, there is no reaction because they do not have either antigen. Okay, blood plasma is primarily composed of A protein, B water, C, fibrinogen, D, nitrogenous waste, and the answer would be B, water. This blood type is considered the universal recipient. Okay, so that would be either A, which is A positive, B, B negative, C, AB positive, or D, O negative. Okay, if it's a universal recipient, then it's AB positive, which would be C. Hemophilius. This is a disorder in which there is a deficiency of A platelets, B red blood cells, C clotting factors, or D vitamin B. Hemophiliacs are lacking C clotting factors. Hemostasis is the process of A making new blood cells, B, 
clotting, C, blood typing, D, all of the above. And the answer would be B, clotting. Now, if you're having a little problems with the blood typing, I strongly suggest that you go to a website. The website is called NobelPrize.org. Once you're on that website, you want to go to the top of the website and click on the Educational tab. Then, you, once you're at that, you can either scroll down and find the blood typing game or you can type in blood typing game to the search bar. This is a fun little quick exercise and it will help you get that whole blood typing straight in your head.